And that's a lesson that, you know, that I've used many, many times since then is focus, you know, especially when you have a startup that many people can come run into your office and say, if we only just went over to automotive and we did this, we could make billions, you know, no, we set a mission up. We got to stay focused. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Founders Journey series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at TerraLeap.io. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my guest, Paul Farrell, who's based in the Washington, D.C. area. He recently sold his firm, Nehemiah Security, to ThreatConnect, and this is actually his fourth firm that he sold profitably. Uh, I'm excited to have you on, Paul. This is, this is very, uh, I'm, in fa I'm, I'm fascinated to hear your, your journey that you've had on the years to get to where you are today, man. So uh, how may I understand, maybe go back to the beginning. That, that, that might be a good place to start of, of selling lots of, of different technology firms, buying and selling. Where did it begin for you? Were you always interested in technology? Um, yeah, I was. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I got to attribute it to God because when I went to college in 1977, I decided to take a sixth course, even though I was paying for school myself um, and computing, like a computing language. And so for eight courses later, two semesters times four, I had eight programming courses. And of course, I uh, got out of college and a job offer was more than 2x what I could you earn using my BS degree in finance. And so it was easy to leap into programming at that time. Now, one of the, the uh, your, uh, earlier positions that you got was actually at, at AOL, not earlier positions, but a big, one of the main ones at, at, at AOL is um, what were you doing at AOL at the time? Well, uh, uh, I was hired in to help them with commercial endeavors. Uh, the first thing I was hired in to do was to sell their dial-up network during the day to businesses that had it. So they had tons of capacity. It worked really, really well, but it also in that was one of the first really big business lessons. So we quickly built that to maybe a $100 million run rate firm in less than you know, 15, 12, 12 to 18 months someplace in there, which is really fast. Uh, but then when we asked for resources, uh, the VP at the time made a very astute, astute decision, which is shut it down because we're a consumer company, you know, B2C, and all our efforts and focus has to do that. And that's a lesson that, you know, that I've used many, many times since then is focus, you know, especially when you have a startup that many people can come run into your office and say, if we only just went over to automotive and we did this, we can make billions, you know, no, we set a mission up. We got to stay focused. It's one of the hardest things to do when you're a young CEO, but when you're, uh, when you, after you've done this a few times, you recognize that, that you hire the most talented and innovative people mm -hmm. and they, they're going to come up with great ideas. And your job is to make sure you steer the ship in the direction to where you're going. Cause we all know if the, sh if the ship gets off one degree and you're going to New York, you're going to end up by in, in Miami from England. Yeah. You know? How did you get into, to buying and selling firm technology firms? Um, so, uh, well, I, I hired out of, of AOL to start working with my chairman and, and he is a student doing that as I never worked with him. I personally worked with him. He was building his own software firm. So, uh, you know, it was just in the DNA that you go buy things, you fix them, you turn around, uh, or you start something up. Um, and, you know, um, though uh, we've had, uh, you know, we worked with the VC initially in 2004, and that was a real big success. And then he was investing in a firm uh, that was a Microsoft reseller, really didn't work for us. The model didn't work for us. And so that lesson there was sometimes, even though, your software is really, really good. It's not going to work and you shut it down and you move on and then went on to more over uh, technologies that Mark McLaughlin, uh, when he was at Verisign, sold us. Um, and then we built that up for, you know, from 2009 to 2014 late and sold it to LexisNexis. And then coming out of that, um, you know, um, we decided that we didn't like the solutions we saw in the cybersecurity market and we'd start something up. Uh, we tried to buy something at first. It didn't work. It was a mistake or a failure, um, whatever way you want to call it, but that you learn by those. And we eventually got it right with uh, Nehemiah, uh, tech, uh, Nehemiah Technologies, Nehemiah Security. 
and uh, the application of, you know, putting a dollar amount and percentages on cybersecurity risk. But it's always a journey, right? You start off thinking you're going to do X, and a lot of things. Well, I think we've talked about this even, you know, as we first met each other as a CEO. It's okay. We're going to come this way. We think we're doing it this way, but no, you've got to be flexible, and especially when you're starting something up, to try and find white space where nobody else is, or a part of a particular thing where none of the other competitors are looking at, uh, either. You know, and that's that's a that is not an exact science. It's, it sounds like it's somewhat messy, but it just really comes from that practical experience. You start to see whether it's patterns or recognition of, of what something could work. I'm curious, in, in across then the different ventures, uh, you've uh, partnered with a lot of folks or, or raised money. When it comes to, to raising funds or partnering with folks to be able to either buy something or start something from scratch, uh, what kind of lessons learned or, or common mistakes people can make when they're, we're in that, that beginning phase that they're looking for funding or partnering to get something started, what would you share? It's not easy. You know, a lot of people have never done it. Think, okay, it's good. I'll, I've got such a great idea. They're going to love it. No, it's not easy. Um, it takes a lot of preparation. Um, you know, when you're, whether you're doing um, angel financing or your A round or whatever, a subsequent round, um, it's all about being sharp and being exact, you know, having a, a deck that's maybe 12 slides, an intro deck that you can get through in under 45 minutes with questions, um, right? It's about having the model when they eventually move like they, beyond interest to looking at you, is about having a model that makes sense because everybody's going to say, well, how are you going to generate revenue? What is your plan? Uh, and they want to see a model, you know, 24, 36 months out, you know, that says this is what we're going to spend and this is what our marketing spend is and this is where we project out will be break, break even if you ever want to get there. Um, it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's not an easy deal. I mean, um, I most recently talked to a person who's, who said he wanted to try some of the stuff that we were just talking about. And I said, well, your accounting books aren't in shape. And he said, what? I go, yeah. Um, you're, the way you account for payroll and expenses in a lump sum just won't work. We have to break that out by department. He says, well, that's an easy thing. I said, no, 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 no. That's probably a two-month project. Right. It's probably a two month project because not only do you have to do the current month, but you got to go back to all your history and make sure it's all done right because it's got to look like we've been doing it all along, you know. So, you know, nothing's ever easy. It, it, it's it's hopefully knowing the right things you should be doing and just get to it so that that it you don't have to go backwards and, and fix things. Yeah. Is it better? That's actually more of a philosophy. Is it better just if someone wants to start a new venture to just get jump in there and then fix it retroactively or start a uh, starter from the beginning? Doing well, it if you're building a prototype, like a software package to, to show it, then it's just get started. Mm -hmm. But if you're starting a venture and you've got some angel financing, it's do everything right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Have all your contracts and, and mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever you decide to use, um, well, some electronic filing, you know, whether it's anything that's out there today, but have all your contracts right, all the NDAs you ever sign right. Understand that it's not a bunch of different forms. They love to see the same form over and over again. That it's not, you know, that you're not signing other people's NDAs and your NDAs aren't all over the place. Understand that keep all your contracts in a place and here's the base contract and Here's all the red lines that we, we agreed to for this customer. And the first ones are going to red line the heck out of it because they want tons of things because they know they're the first customer up. Um, you know, it's, and, you know it, it's about understanding, um, in fact, your elevator pitch, right? Every employee in the beginning has got to understand that. You know, what do you all do? Well, we do X, Y, Z. Great. All right, I understand that. Quick and concise where if you ask, Anybody in a firm, even as you grow, whether you go from three to four to 12 to 24 to 50 to 100, everybody needs to understand the elevator pitch and what are you doing as a, what's your mission as an organization? Um, and some of this stuff seems logical, but it's really easy for it to get out of hand. In other words, you're hiring people quick. We don't have time to, you know, just get in and start supporting customers, or whatever you're supposed to do, or programming. No, everybody's got to understand it. And, and when you slow down and increase your communication 
and transparency. Transparency is that's one that I've learned over the years. It's really, really key. You, it, you know, everybody knows if you're in a cash flow pinch, right? I mean, it, it's happened to us all. You just say, hey, I'm in a cash flow pinch. You know, we're doing the best we can, but you know, you, you're going to see some signs of it around here. And I think that's employees love to hear that, right? They don't love to hear it, but they love the transparency. transparency yeah. yeah. So those are just some examples. Well, one piece is funding, right? It's to be able to be able to run a business, be able to get things started. That is a piece. The next though is actually getting customers to, to and revenue yeah. so they keep going. When it comes to marketing, your experience has definitely been in the B2B space. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is some of the biggest lessons learned you've had over the years on being able to find uh, and get interest and acquire uh, clients in a B2B realm? Well, first of all, it goes back again to the strategy. You know, where do you, what's the product market fit? You know, the thing that you're building or the thing that you dream about or the thing that you have, what's the product market fit? And then you look at all the industries and, you know, there's lots of industries out there, energy, consumer packaged goods, you name it, supply chain. I, I mean, uh, for different products, uh, where does it fit best, right? And then concentrate on an industry. Like, all right, we think it fits best in plastic extruders out, yeah. out of the air. Then go after plastic yeah. extruders and, and, and try and make it work there because once you sell the first one, it's easier to sell another one because, you know, hey, you got a reference in the area as opposed to I sell plastic extruders and I go to uh, a consumer packaged goods company and I say, well, I got this manufacturing concern over here. Well, hold it. That's it makes it much right. more for, for, for Nehemiah security. Did, is, how did you be, how did you get that? Because you started that from scratch from 2015. Yeah. Yeah. How, did, how were you able to, to grow the marketing there? Well, you know, so the, the main focus in your mind security was fintech accounts because they got what we, they got us so easily, right? Uh, we're going to have it. It's, you can think of it as an MBA approach to cybersecurity. Hey, Alexander, you have $150 million of, of uh, risk of cyber risk exposure with a 56% chance of happening. Now, what do you, if you, you could do three things. You could do nothing. You could buy insurance, which is a whole nother model. Are you paying too much, paying too little? Or here's a list of 10 things you could do to reduce your risk. And um, that was, was key. But, you know, we started out, we didn't start out with big financial accounts. We ended up with some great ones, uh, or, you know, in the healthcare and the FinTech area. But we started out with a large credit units. And you know, think about it. The, the key for us was they, they had need, but they didn't have a lot of people. And they were willing to, they wanted to understand it better. Everybody wants to understand it better. So they were a, a key entry point for us. You know, I always say that you don't want to have your first test client like up to bat the World Series. You want to go to the batting cage a few times. Not that the not that these clients that we had were, were any less important. They were so extremely valuable to us. I mean, I, I don't want to make this sound like they weren't. They were very valuable to us. And we uh, thank God the day that we sold them. But, you know, there's a little difference between them and a worldwide financial uh, conglomerate with, you know, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and stuff using your software. And it's a, and it's a progression. So a strategy. Mm, it's like first narrowing down to where do you start and then finding the uh, that industry that you could just focus on, be able to. Yeah, and it might also be that you have a you have a friend in that industry, a former CISO that you worked with before, and you know he's going to buy you or she's going to buy you. You mm -hmm. know, so then you say, hey, uh, Anne Marie, I've got another great thing. Will you help me find it? And this is the reason why you want to do it. And she says yes. Well, then there's your industry. Focus on that because getting the you know getting the funding and getting the first customers are not easy. Mm -hmm. For um, for. Uh, Nehemiah security being in the cybersecurity space, did you just have a fascination with it or just an interest or did you already have like a CTO or a technology person that was able to, to say, hey, this is an opportunity? How did you kind of narrow in and build out the technology? Um, well, we were looking about, we were looking at a lot of things in the cybersecurity area. And then we, we really realized that, wow, 
like there's so many solutions out there and so many people. And the one thing that we really knew that wasn't right was uh, the stoplight reports, red, uh, yellow, green, and or people put their own index on it. You're an 88. Well, what is an 88? And when we saw that, we're like, oh, oh look, I mean, that's not good. I mean, because there's shades of red, there's shades of yellow. Uh, and it really has to do not with the vulnerability of the machine, but it's the, the applications on that machine that are really, really important. The applications on the machine, so two machines. One sits in your office there and has no connectivity and it's weak, but another one is in the other corner of the office is connected to your accounting system. Which one do you want to fix first, right? Your accounting system one. Or the one that has, you know, if you're uh, uh, like an Amazon that has an inventory system on, then that's the one you fix first. Um, and some of those things came together along the way. We, you know, with Nehemiah, we acquired a, a, we got a lot of help by acquiring a company that just did um, cybersecurity uh, analysis for the U.S. government. A bunch of people worked in SCIFs and they were a phenomenal team of like, PhD in mathematics, uh, masters in computer science, and you know, uh, a degree in engineering, and or their mix of and those people were really helpful to work with and to uh, exchange ideas off of. And then we had bright people too. I was very blessed that selection. You see, that's the other thing too. It's you know, product market fit, raising money. Where are you going to go first? But even before all that, I should have said, get the right people. Mm. you know well, the right people is key what would you say when it comes to hiring and building the right team um some common mistakes one could make and try to avoid when when building that building your team well i think it starts also with transparency i mean this is who we are this is what you're going to see like i used to tell here's a story for you uh if anybody was was interviewing with me i kind of tease them a little bit in the interview to see what would happen because our culture was, we were a family out in the bullpen, right? And Alexander, you're going to get teased and they're going to find the two things to get underneath your fingernails. Just even the CEO was subject to it. So I would like try and tease them and then say, hey, you know, um, I don't know, did you grow up a, a single kid? Did you have a lot of, if you did, did you have a lot of cousins or people in the neighborhood around? Because that's going to happen. And so if, if you think you don't like people teasing you, then we're not the place to come. You could be a great candidate. But if you don't slip into the family, um, the Nehemiah family at this time, you know, then, you know, and we, you know, part of the thing is we all got dressed up at Halloween. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, you know, it, it created that kind of culture that even I had to do it. It wasn't my favorite thing to do, but you would do it. And, you know, these, it's all front talking about what your culture is, the things we do. And, you know, and we don't feel like one job's everybody's job. So if we're trying to get something out the door, a proposal, software release, and I got to make copies, I certainly, I'll go over to the machine and make copies or shred paper, whatever I got to do. It's this, this teamwork stuff that is also key. We, when in today's environment, um, when you're looking at a person, how, what do you look for in a good hire beyond the resume and, and, Part of that is the culture fit, but what are you yeah. looking for? Well, I would tell you my best performing team ever was a multicultural team that I put together at AOL. Mix of male and female from um, all the continents in the United States, European, African, South America. I think we had a South America, a couple of Asians and, uh, from that, you know, uh, overseas. And it was phenomenal because brainstorming was great. Because you didn't get the, the, you know, the way we think in the East Coast or the West Coast. And, and I would also say, you know, somebody in the Midwest is also great to have on your team because they think about things differently. Um, and, the, you know, and I think the society is talking a lot about it lately. Uh, and I applaud it, but it, it, a mix of people that think differently, think are good thinkers, but they think differently about approaching a problem. And so now... It's a, it's you can it's almost like 3D modeling. Instead of looking at things one dimensional, you get two or three different views of how people perceive it, and then you can pick the best one. Um, you know, uh, sadly in cybersecurity that doesn't exist. I mean, I look at a lot of websites you can today, and they they tend to be you know very stoic in terms of multiculturalness. But it's one of the things that 
unique. Now you're also hiring and you got to put the best person available that's available now. So early on, you might not be able to do that. Uh, or you might have friends uh, and that's fine. But eventually my suggestion is, is that you focus a little bit on it and try to expand outside the normal paths. You mentioned uh, just a little bit ago that you actually acquired a company uh, and the people themselves uh, at Nehemiah. How did, how did that about actually happen? Can you walk me through that and, and some of the lessons learned there? Well, um, it happened because um, somebody called me and said, hey, um, would you be interested in this cybersecurity firm? And the, the one key for me always, whether buying or selling, is my relationship with the CEO. And um, can you get along with that person? Um, can you quickly, is it argumentative relationship where a simple thing is going to be like fought over tooth and nail, like uh, negotiating school, or will they quickly come to a decision realizing that, Alexander, you, you win this one, I win the next one, but overall we kind of, and if it's an important issue, yeah, you got to do it. But to get through that stuff, because whenever you're buying or selling, it's going to hit the, it's going to hit the wall right? There's something's going to hit the wall and you're going to have to talk about it. And it's just inevitable that you have a great relationship. You can get through that. Um, the other thing that, that I tell people early on is, so the relationship with the CEOs at each end is very important. The other thing is if you're buying something, I tell people it, look, it's like the emperor has no clothes. Uh, you're going to be standing in front of me. I want to know everything about your firm through the due diligence process. And I mean, everything everything do not if, and so here's your one opportunity to tell me you know exactly if there's anything out there uh, and um, you know I've, I've lost money before you know like hundreds of thousands of dollars of due diligence because we found something and I'm like well you know no we're not going to do this anymore and it could be simple things like in the contract it says you that you know um, and the contract with a big customer, you, you tell them you have 5 million of insurance. But I know by looking through the books, you only have 3 million. No, that doesn't work with us. You know, it doesn't work at all. Now, that one can be fixed, but there was other issues similarly. Well, you know, that guy, you know, you know, you said in your contract with this person, the contracts are gold. Do what you look at somebody in your eyes, shake their hands, have a great contract, but fulfill every is issue of the contract. And if you have a contract and it says this person gets most favored nation pricing and you signed it, you can't later on say, well, no, I meant to say uh, excluding federal. No, you don't get to make those decisions later on. You got to, you gotta, unless you go back and amend that contract and they agree with you, you can't, you know, do that. So, you know, you see those kind of types of things, you know, in which what people are looking for is consistency. You know, the contracts are consistent, the people are consistent. Now, and this particular one that I talked about um, was a unique culture because people are highly educated, as I talked to you about earlier. Um, they spent most of their days in skiffs, you know. Um, I had to make a bunch of trips out to them where and meet them for lunch and let them get to know that I wasn't this big scare. In the beginning, they, you know, there was a lot of rumors, they run quick. Oh, our culture's gonna change. These guys are going to do X, Y, Z and X, you know, and it simply didn't happen. Um, you know, uh, they were suspicious and that's okay. That's their nature. That's where they were trained. And over time, it was not us to complain about them being suspicious, but it was on us to keep on being consistent and trustworthy. And then they came over and trusted us after the first year. You know, it's a process. You're not going to go, oh, everybody trust me. Now you got to be seen and be known, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to see them and know them. As a, as a leader now of, of multiple organizations, what would you say um, are some of the, the, the things you might, if you had to go back and tell yourself, you know, uh, 20 years ago, um, something, say, hey, you should really think about this. What would you have gone back and told yourself? Well, that's a really great um, question, Alexander. Um, um, I think I, I realized over time uh, what my best skills are, like what I'm really good at. And so you have to find partners that are complementary to that. Not the same skills, right? But complementary. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm more high level, gut feeling. 
Uh, and so therefore then you need a, a partner that's not a gut feeling partner that's very detailed, we'll look at everything and we'll, um, um, you know, work on models for days and weeks to understand what the numbers really say. And then when they come to you and say, hey, this is what the numbers say, you got to stop what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I had a, a great friend of mine who's a partner and that was the case. So that moreover, when he brought me the financials, um, I would guess what the profit would be. Right. And I didn't know. I mean, I didn't, I mean, I would just know what deals we did, what we did during the month. I had a feel for it. And I was usually within a, a good standard deviation, but if I wasn't, then we just stopped everything until we understood it. You know, like we said, okay, great. Well, okay. Why am I so off? What's the reason? Let's go dig into the numbers. Let's figure it out together, you know, or when he brought me something and it said, well, you know, you think X, but this is why the data doesn't lie. I think, you know, so complementary skills and also data never lies. It's always data, 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 and understanding the data and, and that will always be good. You had, did you have one of those types of individuals at each of your organizations? I'm like, cause you were a big high level. So you, did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, the last two for sure. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you know, that was very, very, um, very, very beneficial. How do you, how do you, if you per se are the, uh, the high level person, how do you go about finding that counterpart? Where, where are you looking for that type of individual? Well, uh, you know, I mean, as I said before, God's always blessed me by, I eventually find them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I got an amazing story. You know, when you're, when you're, um, we were selling moreover and we sold a big uh, consumer electronic company on the West Coast. And the problem was, is they wanted to get started right away, but I didn't have a project manager, right? And so on Friday, we sell this deal, everybody's celebrating. But on Saturday morning, I'm like, oh, well, I don't know how we're gonna get this done. We have to get in Monday morning, and figure it out. And then Monday morning at nine o'clock, the phone rang. And a guy said to me, "We've heard, I've heard about, and this was more of, I heard about more of his reputation. I really like you guys. I've met some people and um, I got two months free. Can I come do project management work for you? That's yeah, I hired him on the spot, blue. but, wow. but this, is, this goes to the, the having that reputation out there where people want to work for you or they've worked for you in the past and they want to come back to work for you, handling everybody the right way, you know, not you know, trying to be admirable in the way they onboard. And, and if you have to get, you have to, you know, lay somebody off, whatever, that's got to be honorable and how people see you in the marketplace is dealing fairly with your employees that people can call. Uh, or, you know, like today, um, you know, I just call friends and say, let's, who do you know what's out there? And it's more that that's the informal network, you know, people, People will know people and you just got to start working your network. Like, I don't know, a little thing is uh, if I have 15 minutes during the day between meetings, um, I make it a purpose to at least twice a day or well, let's say a handful of times a week, call old friends and just text them and say, I'm thinking about you. No, we haven't talked in a long time, but I hope you and your family are well. And, you know, that's really, really important to keep those connections going. It sounds like you're intentional with your relationships around you so that that actually will help. Sure. I mean, it, you, it just doesn't happen by magic, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, by God's grace, a lot of times when I told you that earlier, but also, you know, God supplies the rain, but you got to plow the field, right? Uh, I mean, you know, that's an old yeah. adage, but, you know, rain will come, but you got to be prepared for it. Are there... Have there been ever uh, books, audiobooks, or even podcasts that, that you've read or listened to in the past and would recommend as a leader? Oh, all of them. All the ones on leadership. Um, I tend to be well read in the, uh, the Christian area. Um, there's just never, I mean, I have a thirst for innovation, right? I have a thirst for innovation. I am constantly reading about innovation. Uh, the Malcolm Gradwell books, where he talks about the things why people think. Um, there was a series in a church in Chicago once did on Think Differently, which was like 14 weeks, but unbelievable, like something you would revisit uh, about how God made different individuals and how they need to be communicated with differently. 
Um, I love, I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm real disappointed in that, um, you know, the news comes biased. So I kind of, I rely on the Wall Street Journal and the Econ Economist kind of routine uh, looking at them. But also, you know, the one thing I would also recommend is understand the opposing, the opposing point of view that you have. Um, I think Ted is really, really good for this. So like I might have one view, right? And I go, I'll go to Ted and I'll try and find somebody that's presenting the other view and I'll listen for 15 minutes. The Ted talks, it finds the Ted, the Ted talks, go to the Ted talks and listen. Um, you know, um, you know, as a father of a daughter, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to hurt this on your podcast or not. I, I don't believe in unisex bathrooms, right? It's just not, I just have a problem with it. And maybe my age and stuff, you know, but I'll go to Ted talks and I'll pull up the opposing point of view and say, tell me, tell me what you think, you know? So, cause you got to, you know, you got to transform your mind as you, as you get older, transforming your mind in new ways of thinking. Well, what you did before is not going to work again, mm -hmm. right? So you got to be out there thinking, and you know, we, we live in, you know, pretty charged up times and people are, are saying a lot of different things, but how do you filter it out? Because remember, if, and I always say this to my sales guys, if a prospect thinks, or in this case, a person thinks one plus one equals three, then it does in their mind until you present information. So they think one plus one equals two. Or, you know, you, they think one plus one equals two and you think one plus one equals three, take the other side. Then you got to get together to decide who's right. But you don't do that by only hanging out with people who think and act the same way you do, right? Because everybody in your universe says one plus one equals three. But there's less example. No, you got you to gotta get out there and you got to read. Read, 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 read. Listen to podcasts, audio books. I mean, consume those, listen to those things, listen to what people are saying, and but then don't take it as, as, as gospel. Get on Google and do a search about those things and read other articles. I mean, the, that's the great thing about the internet, but I don't think a lot of people take time to research the salient issues. It's, it's being able to, to understand both sides of the arguments and, and, and a desire to want to understand. So I, I feel like over the years, what I'm hearing, kind of seeing a couple of things is one, the, the need to connect you like you've actually put an intentional focus on keeping those connections alive, both for, for funding purposes, for hiring purposes, and then also for sales. Like for friendship, for just for yeah. friendship. I mean, don't put that in there. I mean, I talked to a former head of development this morning that I haven't talked to in four or five months. Just because of friendship, I wanted to find out he had problems with his leg. I wanted to find out how that was going. Did it recur? How his mother is it getting on an age? And how's she doing? These are important things to figure out. And it's not because anything that I want is never. I want to know how they're doing as a person. And you know, you can talk business and stuff, but no, the important thing is you know, how are you doing? How's your mom doing? How's life? You know, what's going on? Being intentional with relationships <laughs> sounds yeah. like that. That's been a key for 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 a, a happy life, a successful life, a good life. Yeah. And and I I appreciate both the the journey that and you've given us a few. Yeah, but it also it's works good. with your wife, right? Being intentional yeah. about growing your relationship there, and and you know doing the right things by that, and your children, and the other people around you. That that is a whole other piece of of being able to grow successful businesses, but not at the expense of personal relationships, your family, your wife, um, would there be any uh, word of wisdom that you would share of, of, of how you've been able to balance it over the years? Well, I did it wrong. I'm going to tell you that much. I did it wrong for four decades because I only had, you know, I was working as a CEO, dedicating, you know, 12 hours a day. I had children, we had two, blessed by two beautiful children, a boy and a girl. Uh, they're now in their 20s, my wife of over 30 years. Um, I cheated sleep for four, over four decades. Um, it's the one thing I can do without, you know, work, work on four hours a week and then crash four hours a night for four or five days and crash, you know, um, you know, terrible at sleeping. Uh, and now it's taken me months to correct it and try and you know do it, but it makes such a big difference when you do the research. Um, but also look at God, family work. Does it gotta be, those are the priorities. Um, and if you're missing a work meeting right now, as you're listening to this podcast, 
uh, it's because you're going to a, a little league game or a ballet performance or whatever, a birthday party in the family, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. That's, that's wisdom of, 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 you know, over four decades uh, working, you're doing the right thing. Um, and the rest of the stuff will catch up eventually. Paul, this has been powerful. Thank you so much for, for sharing just a few insights and tips of, of, yeah. of over these years. Um, thank you again. Uh, for those that want more, you can listen again to this full episode, see the content at uptechreport.com. Appreciate you being on today's episode, Paul. Oh, thank you very much. Look forward to maintaining a relationship over the decades with you, Alexander. Absolutely. We'll see you all on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know. Thank you.